Welcome everyone. My name is Laura Woodward Cavers. I am the reader advisor here at New Canaan Library. And with me is Dr. Michael Grote. He is a chief clinical officer at Silver Hill Hospital. Uh, our program tonight is called Dealing with COVID Stress. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that uh, we are in a webinar style. And so you are not able to speak. Uh, everyone is muted. But if you do have questions at the bottom of the screen, if you just move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A box. You may click on that and a box will open up and you'll be able to type into that. So if you have any questions for us, please do put your questions right in there. And I will be monitoring that while Dr. Grout is uh, doing the presentation. Um, and then we also do have coming through, we have three polling questions that we will ask you. All the polling questions are anonymous when you answer. So no one will know what your answer is. Um, and um, I think that's about it. Dr. Grout, I am um, glad that you are here. Uh, this um, pandemic is stretching on and on, though there is a glimmer of hope for these inoculations that are coming, the, uh, that you sort of, I sort of feel, you know, lightened by the fact that maybe this will be over soon, but then I'm told that no, that is not. Uh, that still we will, the, the whole rollout of everything is going to be even longer. And so that makes me anxious again. And I feel a lot of other people are feeling that as well. Not only having gone the whole year with, uh, living with this threat around, but also having to really change our behaviors. And when you and I spoke a few weeks ago, you brought up some great words that I didn't know about. And one of those was pile on or pile up and then also rewards. And so I'd like you to please explain to everyone how that is something to recognize and to also give yourself. So go ahead, take it away, Dr. Grout. Thank you for being here. Okay. Uh, thank you, Laura. And it's uh, great to be with you all this evening. I do wish I could see you all uh, somehow in person. And that's part of the challenge we face right now is that our normal human desire and the reward we uh, obtain from direct human contact and interaction um, is, is thwarted because of this uh, necess necessary um, you know, effort we have to make to prevent infecting one another. And so that's one of the stressors that we're all facing. Uh, one of the ways that Laura and I have uh, planned to address that this evening is by involving you. And so, you know, as I walk through some material this evening, we're gonna pause and we're gonna solicit your input and your uh, thoughts um, so that we can dialogue together the best we can using this format. Um, so uh, with that said, I wanna share with you uh, some some slides that will accompany things I'll be talking about. I'm not gonna read the slides to you, uh, but I will reference them uh, and provide them as a guide to you uh, as we uh, go through some material together. So let me share that with you. And um, here uh, we are with um, some, some, some basic slides I have prepared for you. So, so the focus for this evening is on, you know, how we can cope with you know, the stress of the pandemic. And in the process of coping with this particular stress and, and the marathon nature of it, uh, build our overall uh, resiliency. Is that something that is a, an essential uh, way of being able to cope with whatever stressors might come our way? So hopefully there are some things you can gain from this evening that you can take with you to apply to a variety of different stressors in your lives. Uh, so, uh, want to talk specifically right now. And, and what I want to do is, is share with you a larger context of stressors that are particularly relevant in the face of COVID. And I'm sharing this with you as an attempt to normalize the kinds of stress that we're facing and to put some language to it and some context. So, so first of all, you know, there are a number of people who may live with some underlying medical conditions such as diabetes. Uh, maybe you have, um, some kind of pulmonary disease, heart disease. And you know, we know from some of the data that has emerged from studying uh, COVID uh, illness 
that you know certain groups of people are a little bit more vulnerable to certain kinds of symptoms. Well, this kind of threat, right? One of the things about anxiety is that it's linked to the appraisal, right? The appraisal of a situation as potentially threatening to us. So we see that individuals who are uh, dealing with difficult health conditions are more anxious in living through the COVID era. And you know, Laura and I were talking about how that anxiety can manifest itself as you know fears of going into an enclosed space. You know, even going into the library can feel more threatening because of a risk to our own personal health. Uh, we also know that the work, the experience of work has changed dramatically in the last you know, nine months. Uh, on the one hand, we have a number of people who are working remotely and that presents a whole range of different kinds of challenges. You know, working from home, you might have your children in the home or doing hybrid learning, uh, trying to balance parenting and working the sense of boundaries between that's work and this is home has in some cases eroded or dissolved entirely. And that the experience of relating to people all day long through a screen can contribute to this sense of disconnection and, and called a zombie effect, you know, that we can get fatigued by this constant interaction and connection through technology and dealing with the stresses and strains of technology, such as I, I think the the code phrase for 2020 is going to be, you're on mute. And I think uh, probably three or four times a day, I say to various colleagues, you're on mute, uh, John or Jane, I can't hear you. And so, you know, we're living in a new era. We've had to adapt very quickly. We've had to learn the technology. And then, you know, some of us have also dealt with, and I've dealt with this, um, you know, financial disruptions, right? That, uh, you know, we in some in industries, there have been furloughs or layoffs or changed policies. Um, and that, you know, for folks who are working to providing direct care, like we do here at Silver Hill and other hospitals, you know, there are increased risks. You know, people need to be taken care of and someone needs to be there in person taking care of them. So that presents new risks and new threats. Um, we also, you know, in this era of, you know, sheltering in place and protecting ourselves, there's a sense of life being on hold. You know, we're not doing our normal vacations. You know, we're not going to some of our favorite restaurants. You know, we are spending more time going to the park in these wide open spaces outdoors. And, um, you know, our lives have become curtailed in so many ways. That becomes a stressor that there's a sense of fatigue that sits in frustration that sense in, and this can also impact our sense of mental well-being. And interesting enough, looking at different populations across the lifespan, we have children, adolescents, young adults, older adults, and seniors. What's so interesting, you look at um, you know, the data that's emerging, we've had a number of young adults, people in their 20s who are emerging into adulthood, you know, moving back in with their parents. And in fact, the predictions are right now based on the movement of people back into their uh, family home of origin, we're gonna see rates of living with parents that are actually double what they were in 2008 with the big economic recession of 2008. So we are seeing some major societal changes and this has implications for what is it like to have your uh, loved one who's mid twenties move back home and try to renegotiate what that's like. And that could be another source of stress. So we want to pause here. We've identified a few big picture stressors and hear from you. So Laura is going to uh, share with you a poll. And we want to hear from you. Okay. So here's the poll. Uh, all of the uh, questions answers are anonymous. So all you need to do is, is just go ahead and pick on any of these stressors that are bothering you. And it's sort of like we get a, uh, we get a voting in a sense. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. People are uh, responding. I can't see that, but that's great. I love it. It's good yeah, to have everyone. We'll be sharing uh, the results very soon, Dr. Grote. Oh, great. I can't wait to to see what people are sharing. Okay. I'm going to, uh, in about 10 seconds, I'm going to end the polling. So get your choices in 
and then I will show you what everyone has said. Or maybe you all can see this. I'm not sure if you can see this right now. Okay. All right. I'm ending it right now. Okay. And here. Oh, let's can you see. see the results? Uh, let's see. Yeah, we see uh, worries, so worries about, about becoming, becoming ill with COVID are yeah. very, very high. Very high, yes. And then it's nowhere to go. Shut down the favorite activities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Worrying about other people, fear of other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, there you have it, Dr. Grote. Now you know uh, how to tailor everything here. Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll certainly be keeping, you know, you in mind as uh, we go through and talk together about about these stressors and and uh, so helpful to get your feedback so we can, as as Laura's pointing out, tailor uh, some of our discussion to the particular concerns that number of you are raising. So, you know, actually, my next slide here is dealing with older adults. So we have young adults, we have t uh, kids. Uh, a lot of young adults are saying, you know, my life feels like it's on hold and you know, what's my life going to be like now? Uh, we have people who are delaying marriage uh, in relationship to COVID. And we have a number of older adults who are dealing with the stresses and the worries uh, that can accompany health conditions, as well as, you know, being later in life and feeling disconnected from one's grandchildren, feeling disconnected from the socializing that one once was able to do more freely. Uh, you know, just the other day, I was speaking with a gentleman who's in his 70s who, you know, used to go to the golf course uh, several times a week and spent, that was a very, very important part of his social life. And it's really been curtailed and it's having a big impact on him. And so this is a, is a big issue. Um, he doesn't go to the golf course because of concerns about his own health, uh, which is something that a number of you spoke to, but then it's affected him socially. So I want to talk about you know, the types of stress uh, that we humans can face. So on a, on a continuum, right, we have what we might call traumatic stress, which is you know, the most intense form of stress that we humans can face. Something that is you know, really impactful. You know, it's it's um, something that can be threatening to our very life itself or our bodily integrity. And you know, we call this a, a form of post-traumatic stress syndrome can be a result of overwhelming, impactful, very threatening uh, type of stressful events. And then there's another form of stress we can, which Laura had referenced earlier, which I talk about as stress pile up. In other words, a series of stressors in our lives that accumulate and they build up over time. And COVID is one of those stressors that overlays whatever other stresses we've already had in our lives, right? Or introduces new stresses. And so what we can see is this accumulation of stress. And, you know, in thinking about stress and the human experience of stress at a bodily level, right? All of us, you know, inhabit a body and we have a psychological experience of living in our bodies that, you know, each of us have you know, we have different temperaments. Some of us may be more sensitive to stress than others. You know, for example, you know, we know that uh, sometimes early in life, people are very sensitive to stimuli, you know, certain kind of clothing or too much noise or things of that nature can feel uh, really uncomfortable and stressful. Whereas other people, eh, loud noise doesn't really bother me or different textures or taste doesn't really bother me. And so there's a, a natural human variation among all of us in terms of our sensitivities to various kinds of stressors. So you then combine that with the fact that all of us face stress. Stress is part of the kind of uh, condition of being a human and actually most living creatures face daily challenges, right? Getting food, right? Uh, being able to care for ourselves involves a challenge of how am I going to do this? And some of these things become very easy for us. But as the challenges grow, right? Um, you know, our ability to cope with them and work optimal functioning can be at this kind of peak performance. But that when we reach a certain threshold, and I'll show you this, when we reach a certain threshold, actually the stress is so much that our functioning starts decreasing. 
And I imagine a number of you can relate to this, that you know, you're going along, you're doing okay, you're in your game, you know, you're able to focus, you're able to do good problem solving, you know, you're able to be balanced in how you see things. But then you reach that tipping point, right? Where things just, you start getting overwhelmed. You um, start having trouble, you know, concentrating. Um, you, and you can start experiencing kind of physical symptoms, feeling restless. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about some of those things. So each of us can be, you know, moved out of our zone to more optimal functioning. And if you think about it right now, the stresses of COVID, right, add to the general stress that we're all feeling, which then can, you know, tilt us a little bit more in the direction of, you know, there's only so much capacity we have, right? Because we're already trying to cope as it is. And so, you know, part of this is, you know, recognizing our zone and in, in the indicators that, you know, we're getting outside of a zone. Now, these days, I'm not hearing too many people tell me, you know, my stress is too little. I don't know about you, maybe you're hearing that, but I, I don't hear that very often. I'm, I'm absolutely bored. However, not having enough stimulation can be stressful, right? That we might crave a little bit more stimulation. So that could be true. A number of people, I, maybe because I'm in you know, a busy hospital and I'm doing a lot of things, you know, I hear a lot of people talk about you know, getting in a little overwhelmed, right? And, and feeling frantic and running around and, and how do we find our, our kind of optimal zone? And so before we go forward and start talking more about some of the common ways stress manifests itself when we move outside of our optimal zone, we wanna uh, pull you again and uh, ask you about any stress symptoms you're experiencing. Oops. Huh? Sorry, trying to get that next question. Here we go. No worries. Here we are. Here's the question. What stress symptom symptoms are you experiencing? All answers are anonymous and you can check off more than one symptom. Go right ahead. Polling is beginning and we will see what it is at the end. Oh boy. I got a lot of, a lot of participation. Yeah. It's wonderful to have all this participation. Love it. Okay. Okay, I'm going to end the polling in about 10 seconds. So get your answers in and then I will end it and share with you the results. Okay. All right, so we see here anxious feelings, yes, yes. Anxious feelings, lack of concentration, feeling restless, yes. Disturbed sleep, mm -hmm. feeling a little bit more irritable, argumentative, difficulty making decisions. Yeah, these are, these are exactly the kinds of stress symptoms that um, I'm speaking about. And uh, I hear, yeah, especially the anxiety, really high. And, and Dr. Grote, may I just ask a yeah. question? When you have like disrupted sleep, that can also be something that is the factor of your lack of concentration. Mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're feeling kind of um, un, not under the weather, but a little just off because of lack of sleep. Mm -hmm. um, so all of these things are actually compounding each other, are they not? Yes, they're, they're all interrelated, right? Now, one of the things happens uh, with the state of anxiety, right? So anxiety, the experience of anxiety is an activating experience. So we think about the, the sympathetic nervous system and the ways in which we are you know, primed for engaging in action. And probably a number of you may have heard of the kind of basic uh, aspects of protective mechanism that's hardwired into us as humans, right? We call it the fight, flight, or kind of inhibited response in relationship to stressors. And so you think about the fight flight phenomenon, right? Our bodies are primed and prepared to move, to take action. 
And so when we live in states of heightened arousal, such as you see in states of anxiety, it can become exhausting. And probably a number of us have had that experience of getting exhausted from stress and anxiety and panic. And that it, you're precisely right, Laura, that this that, that state of high arousal carries over into the night and can contribute to restless sleep. And then unfortunately, think about it this way, we enter into the day a little bit more tired. We don't have the same reserve, right? Our zone of optimal functioning is a little bit less. Um, our, our resource to draw from is a little bit less and it makes it more difficult to maintain perspective. So thinking about this at a neurobiological level, our, pre, our prefrontal cortex, which is you know, this part of our head and our brain, the prefrontal cortex is involved in mediating between the emotional responses that we have, right, to threats, and the prefrontal cortex helps us evaluate those and make plans around those things, right, kind of the executive functioning part of our mind. Well, it's a little bit harder to have the same kind of space of mind to think things through when we're feeling really stressed and tired, right? So we talk about you know, oh, that person might need to take a good nap, right? And they'll feel a little bit better. Well, actually, you know, sleep does help us. Rest, real rest can help us get perspective. I just have one more thing, Dr. Grote, if I may yeah, um, sure. ask it. Actually, it was a, a one of our audience members put into the uh, chat or the question and answers. Uh, also, not being able to foresee the future. Yes. is a huge stress that she, this person was acknowledging. So yeah. is that a part of the anxiety? Is that a, just not being able to plan? That, that's, that is a major source of anxiety. In fact, common to many different types of states of anxiety is difficulty with uncertainty. And so this is a shared human experience that when we're not sure, right, there's a there's a situation that we appraise as potentially threatening. Is that person going to like what I have to say? Is that person going to, you know, how are they going to react to me? What's going to happen if I lose my job? What's going to happen here, right? These, all these situations that there are elements of uncertainty, right? And it can activate a sense of anxiety and worry and even rumination, right? So rumination is another manifestation of states of anxiety where we, you know, go over something repetitively. And, you know, rumination is, is, a, is another kind of aspect of trying to cope, right? It's a way of trying to cope. I'm trying to make sense out of something that doesn't quite jive. So, so I'm glad we're speaking these issues. We're going to talk a little bit more tonight about dealing with uncertainty. So, um, you know, I, I, we talked about the zone of optimal functioning and and you know things that you know can push me out of my zone you know would be trying to take on too much you know not sleeping enough being in a hurry and you know and sometimes you know we also can hold expectations of ourselves right that that place demands on us so we might expect you know really really high we might have really high standards and on the one hand that can be positive we can you know strive to achieve on the other hand, it can put a lot of pressure, right? Especially for self-critical or perfectionistic, right? So that can add to the stress and move us out of an optimal zone because we're preoccupied with worry or if we have a disappointment, right? So, so these are just some examples of things that can move us out of our zones, a more optimal kind of balanced, I'm feeling loose and ready uh, functioning. And you know, a number of you have done so nicely in identifying uh, symptoms of stress. I want to just walk through some, some other ones in addition to things you've named. Uh, you know, physically, um, you know, that we can experience in our bodies, the, the tension, right? Thinking about that activation I mentioned before with anxiety and, and the way we can feel constricted. Um, we can feel it in our guts. And uh, that, that, actually the, the experience of stress can exacerbate or worsen any kind of underlying health condition we have. So if you may be vulnerable to arrhythmia, you might actually have more arrhythmia. Uh, if you're vulnerable to um, you know, diabetic uh, instability, right? That may become more of, an, of a challenge. Uh, and thinking emotionally, some of you mentioned irritability and feeling restless, um, you know, feeling discouraged, difficulty concentrating. 
So these are all symptoms of that overactivation. And we're going to talk tonight about how to bring some of that down. That's really important. How do we bring, how do we find some rest and some peace of mind? Uh, behaviorally, things you've already mentioned, you know, difficulties with sleep, difficulty relaxing, you know, feeling short and irritable. Um, you know, right now, you know, one of the things I see is a number of people who come in and say, you know, I've been drinking a little bit more than usual. And, and you know, for some of us, we're susceptible maybe to, um, you know, drinking more than, you know, we might need to, and, and, and that can create new problems for us. And so I'm seeing a lot of that, people struggling with trying to cope through, through substances. Um, it, what's interesting is, you know, I've certainly have been tracking the last few months, we have, you know, people coming to us for, for assistance and support. And, you know, two things have kind of stood out to me. One is disruption to sleep. Uh, another is cracked teeth. Uh, recently read a report uh, that came out from the American uh, Dental Association that since earlier this year, there's been over a 50% increase in people going to dentists manifesting chipped teeth, cracked teeth. Well, what's this from? It's from stress. It's from the, the enormous pressure, right? The, think about the pressure put on the teeth. Uh, and that's kind of a behavioral manifestation of stress. We also see interpersonally, you know, people feeling like I just have had it, leave me alone, um, you know, or trying to uh, cope through, you know, well, I don't really have any place to go anyway, I'll just work a lot of extra hours. Um, it can really impact our, our interpersonal relationships, the stress we're living under. And one of the things about stress is we can literally become ill with depression. So depression is an illness that is the outcome of stress pile up, that we can literally become ill. So you think about on the one hand, we have all these activating experiences, the state of high arousal or a sympathetic nervous system is active, active, cortisol is being released, there's inflammation. We can become then depressed. And one of the things about depression is we see this depletion of serotonin, right? Serotonin is connected to mood. We also see this impact on dopamine and norepinephrine. These, these are neurotransmitters that are connected to mood, sense of feeling motivation. And when we're depressed, you know, we don't really feel like doing much, right? We don't find the stuff that we found rewarding before, very rewarding at all. And so there's a way we literally become worn down and can start feeling um, like, you know, I don't really have much energy. I don't really enjoy what I used to anymore. And, and maybe even feeling hopeless about getting out of that state. And what's interesting here is just looking at the state of Connecticut, that, uh, you know, this is just from a few months ago, and, and I'm um, looking forward to new data on this. But, you know, here in Connecticut, we have seen, you know, a number of adult, adults, nearly almost 40% reporting some states of anxiety or depression. This is understandable, given the context of what we're living through. So, hey, Dr. Grove, I'm sorry, you mentioned something that was truly amazing about how this stress can also create inflammation. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about inflammation, I mean, is it inflammation of the brain, inflammation of the heart, of uh, all over, or is it just muscles and tendons? Uh, when you say inflammation, that was surprising to me. Yeah, there, there is um, evidence that prolonged stress can... Um, create different kinds of inflammatory responses um, throughout the cardiovascular system, which can include the brain. And that, you know, you can see elevation in temperature, you know, slight elevations in temperature. Um, and, you know, there's a whole literature on that, which I'm, you know, not, don't have expertise in, um, but it certainly is a, a contributory factor. In fact, if you look at, um, you know, there have been a number of studies done on what are called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs studies. And they've looked at, you know, through the chronic exposure to stressful life experiences throughout childhood, it actually leaves us more vulnerable to certain kinds of illnesses and as adults and inflammatory uh, related illnesses like cardiovascular disease can leave us more vulnerable to some forms of cancer and diabetes. Mm. So there are there are these real physiological impacts to stress, which is why 
you know, resiliency is so important. And, you know, I know today we're focusing more on the mental health aspect, um, which is why I mentioned it can make us ill with depression. And there is some, some research that looks at uh, connection between inflammation and depression. Thank you. I didn't mean to take you off course. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm happy to anytime uh, talk about uh, things. Uh, and so, so, you know, given this context, right, I'm just bringing some, some framework to what we know or hear about, I want to talk about building resiliency, which is the sense that, you know what, these are hard things and my resources are tapped, but I think I can do it. I want to talk about how, how I think we can do it based on, you know, what we know from the best of uh, psychological science. So first of all, um, you know, one, I, I've been mentioning the idea of appraisal, right? How we appraise or how we make sense out of, how we interpret different situations. Well, one of the things we know from research is that how we appraise what we experience in our bodies matters, right? So, so if I uh, appraise that, you know, the stress I'm experiencing, I'm feeling because I'm unprepared, okay, that's one form of thought, right? One appraisal. And another form of thought might be, well, my body is said, sending me some signals about something I really care about. So for example, if, you know, preparing for this evening, uh, I was, if I was in my office here and feeling really anxious and, you know, and, and kind of focusing on I'm unprepared, right? That would be one appraisal. Another might be, you know what? Um, this stress I'm feeling in this kind of experience I'm having, maybe it's saying something about how I really want to do a good job and I want to be prepared to do a good job. And that's something I care about. So how can I be prepared for that? And how can I use, transform this kind of experience I'm noticing in my body and think about it in a way that is in a direction of, this is something I want, I care about and I want to address the best I can, right? So you can hear that's just one example of how reappraisals um, of our physiological experience can make a difference. Also, um, you know, some, some, for some of those of you who may have, uh, you know, studied public speaking before, um, you know, it's a common kind of coaching uh, tip to say to someone who's about to go on a stage, you know, think about all that flutter you're feeling right now as the excitement of going and sharing your ideas. It's a reframe, right? It's a way of rethinking uh, the stress that you're experiencing. So that's, that's a part of what can help us be resilient. And one thing that's interesting about panic disorder is that in the face of fear, what can happen is we can, we can experience intense fear and then we can react to that fear as if, uh-oh, something terrible is happening. And what's interesting is that a reaction of fear to fear actually can help it only escalate and move into a state of panic. So one of the treatments for panic disorder is learning to reappraise intense fear and say, you know what, I'm facing intense fear. I can survive this. I can let that feeling go through me. Feelings don't last forever. We might fear that they will, but they don't last forever. And we can learn to appraise and relate to our fear differently. So this is really important in terms of building resiliency. So uh, another aspect of, of managing, you know, in our bodily experiences is actively evoking the relaxation response. And one of the things that we can do to activate the relaxation response is to breathe. Breathing is a very powerful, fundamental resource that we have all the time, right? All of us presumably are breathing all the time, but by being intentional about our breathing, we can actually do something really positive for ourselves. To take that breath, really take it in and let it out. And to do that four or five times in a row, to do it throughout the day, that is a way of grounding ourselves back in our breath. It actually calms, I mentioned before the sympathetic nervous system, it helps start calming us at a neurobiological level, calming the heart rate, right? calming our minds. And then 
you know, you, you can see in the, the diagrams here, you know, using our belly, you know, really allowing ourselves to take our breath in because when we're stressed, right, we tend to breathe more in a shallow way. Um, there's progressive muscle relaxation. So you can go onto YouTube and you can actually watch a little video on progressive. There are some things that'll guide you through it. You know, uh, you know, tightening up your arms and then letting them relax. Tightening up your leg muscles and letting them relax. These are kinds of things that all of you can do in your home and help bring calm. Uh, so we're gonna wanna pause here, not put you to sleep. I want you to be relaxed, but not asleep yet. I do hope everyone can sleep well tonight. But I want to hear from you about what helps you relax? What helps bring calm to your body? Here is the poll. What, what helps you relax? Oh, are people not seeing the uh, the poll? Oh, here we go. <laughs> okay. I'm going to uh, close down the polling in about 10 seconds. So get your answers in. Okay, let's take a look. Okay, I'm ending the polling and here okay. you go. Okay. Exercise, excellent. Yeah, exercise is a great way to relax and bring calm to the body, to our bodies. Bringing outdoors, yeah, that's a really really important way to relax. Meditation, I see a number of you meditate. Prayer, yes. Prayer is a definitely a very calming. Uh, calling or Zooming a friend, lighting a letter. Yeah, yeah. Um, getting caught up on things. Um, turning off electronic devices, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I love seeing how many of you named exercise because exercise is, you know, incredibly potent way to manage stress and to, to cope effectively, you know, even if it's a brisk walk, right? Um, it's all we need, you know, a brisk walk, brisk walk, walking around. Thank you so much. I appreciate your, your participation there. Uh, and want to uh, share with you some other um, things we can do. Now, uh, I'm borrowing from uh, the idea of emotional intelligence and what I'm referring to in particular is, you know, how do we take care of ourselves emotionally in emotionally intelligent ways? So uh, people like me, psychologists like me, you know, like to study, you know, what are some way, things that we can do to solve emotional difficulties and stresses and strains that all humans deal with, right? So I'll share with you some four emotionally intelligent moves, self-care, which is a fairly straightforward one, but when we struggle with, you know, if we're drained, we can't help much. Uh, I'm gonna introduce you to the marshmallow test, uh, talk about living by our core values and being flexible and being attached to people and why that matters, okay? So self-care, you know, you can all read here the uh, type of things that are involved in self-care, you know, really bringing, uh, you know, a, a time of intentionally setting aside time to restore our energy. So as an example, you know, this past week has been super busy. The past few weeks have been super busy. I worked throughout the Thanksgiving week. I'm taking tomorrow off. And I'm taking tomorrow off because it's a planned rest, a time set aside. You know, I have a little bit of a neck ache today. Maybe I slept on it wrong, not sure. Try to relax that, exercise, rest. And I asked my assistant, I want to have time off next week and the week after. And setting aside that time to rest and to care for myself. And to be able to convey to my staff that self-care is important because people, they watch what I do, right? They don't just listen to what I say. I can talk all day about, you know, take care of yourself, but they don't see me doing it 
that matters. My kids don't see me doing it, that matters. So me taking the time to set aside caring for myself and to recognize and to, to be able to say to myself, this is okay, I need to do this because if I can't do this, I can't be present for other people. And another part of this, I think, is, um, you know, for, you know, we humans can be impatient, we can get frustrated, we can, you know, deal with a lot of different, uh, you know, disappointments, right? And I love this, this phrase, this is from a, a psychologist who's in Texas, and, you know, she thinks a lot about how do we relate to ourselves with compassion? You know, we can talk in various faith traditions about, and in, in healing traditions, how do we have compassion for people? But how do we have compassion for ourselves that when things don't go the way we might want, that we can relate to ourselves as understanding, compassion, try to understand how, why they go that way. And, uh, and, and sometimes we need a friend to help us look at our situation in a compassionate way. So I think of compassion as another way of caring for ourselves, okay? And you know, these are some of the things that we know from a, just an abundance of research. And if you look at it, you know, sleep and hydration and exercise. And I love how a number of you said getting outdoors. These are all things that are fundamental building blocks of resiliency and, and keeping ourselves well, right? And we'll talk a bit more about gratitude in a minute. Before we do that, though, I wanna talk about this marshmallow. Okay, so you have this little girl here. She's looking at this marshmallow. And there have actually been tests on uh, in, in various kind of laboratories, like with this little girl, where, you know, a, a kid has presented a marshmallow, usually a very desirable, tasty little object for a kid, and a lot of adults too. And uh, their task is to, to sit there and uh, tolerate, you know, not eating the marshmallow. Now they can have the marshmallow after, you know, maybe 30 seconds, but if they wait one minute or two minutes or a little longer, they get maybe two marshmallows. And so it's an exercise in frustration tolerance and being able to delay gratification. So one of the things that can happen is if you extract from this, and, and I'll, I'll note that uh, a lot of the empirical studies that have been done on the marshmallow test actually have some predictive value. You can see uh, differences in terms of people's ability to delay gratification. You know, some people might just impulsively, you know, I want it, I want it now, and they gobble it up. Well, in real life, things may be more difficult for someone who's just, you know, I want it, I want it now, and I'm not going to be able to wait and get really frustrated in contrast to, you know, this, this little girl has different choices about how she can cope. She could, if you think about it, she could get really mad and say, why don't you give me the marshmallow now? Okay, that's one response. She could choose to say, you know what? I'm gonna enjoy this moment and I'm gonna take my time and take it one second at a time, you know, and go through this and, and just be in the process. Maybe she could even choose to follow her breath. Be surprising for a five-year-old, but maybe. Or she might, uh, as a grounding exercise, she might look around the room and notice everything that's round, right? That's actually a sensory grounding technique that we use here for people who are feeling stressed. Let's look at everything in the room that's round. Or let's identify everything in the room that's a square. Or let's go through all of your five senses and notice what you sense. So there's a whole range of ways she can be in the moment and cope with that moment. And so this is an important point because when you're dealing with a pandemic, something that goes on for a long time, in fact, Laura and I were talking earlier about this kind of marathon. I mean, it's kind of like an ultra marathon, right? This has been going on. We are living with the pandemic for who knows how much longer. And we're faced with the challenge of how do we stay in the moment step by step? Because if we get so focused on the destination of the day when we don't wear a mask, the day there's a vaccine, we're going to prime ourselves, right, to be more stressed. Now, this goes to the issue of uncertainty. 
one of the things that can really help ground us in the face of uncertainty is staying connected to the bigger picture, the higher principles, the, the bigger purposes of our lives, and to, to, to orient ourselves in that direction. That, you know, in the face of uncertainties, we can be grounded in things that are really core to us, core values. So some of us might say, you know, my core value is being close to my family, knowing them. And, you know, I've uh, just today I was part of a meeting where uh, people were discussing what they're, what they're grateful for. And a number of people said, you know, this pandemic really sucks. But, you know, I've actually had really much more quality time with family members and getting to know them and feel closer to them. Well, that's interesting. That could be part of a core value. Maybe we really value that kind of closeness. Or, um, you know, I have been able to learn some new things. You know, I'm not going out much, so I've been learning new things in the kitchen. That's a moment to recognize the importance to us of learning. So these, you know, staying connected to these things that are core values or purposes help us cope with uncertainty and the process of going through a long experience. And in fact, you know, just think about very practically, uh, I've been reading up on how astronauts cope with being at the International Space Station. Talk about, you know, <laughs> being out there in space for a year, right? You don't have a lot of stimulation. I mean, maybe there's another astronaut or two around. Uh, but, you know, reading the stories, what they talk about is these, it's like an test of endurance. And people will put a little picture of what's important to them to remember that, to think about, this is what's really important to me. And to also be connected to what's important while they're in space. Um, this one woman, uh, astronaut, she wrote about uh, the experience of, she was participating with her friends in bicycling in space. So, you know, they're bicycling down on Earth and, you know, she's kind of going through the motions of bicycling in space. And what was really important to her was to stay connected to her friends in the shared activity, even though she couldn't be there in person. So, uh, hunting the good stuff. Um, this, this gets to the, you know, issues of gratitude. And, you know, this is complicated because on the one hand, we may be having difficult times. We may be facing, you know, financial stress. Maybe we've had a, a, a job disruption. Um, you know, maybe we've been ill. Maybe we've known someone who's been ill. Maybe we've known someone who's passed away. Those are sad experiences, difficult experiences. And we need to acknowledge those and, and to uh, find support around those. At the same time, when we're stressed, right, when we're, when we're assessing situations for threat, we can be very prone to kind of find the negative. And that could be adaptive, right? When there's a lot of threatening things around, you want to kind of be, be aware of those things. But gratitude can be an antidote. Okay, when we're ready, you know, if we're, you know, feeling grief for the loss of someone that we're going to, you know, be feeling grief. That grief might also be accompanied by a sense of gratitude. You know, I'm really glad that this person introduced me to this, or this person brought this to my life. Or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really grateful that the experience of sheltering in place has made me uh, appreciate the, 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 the smaller things of life more. Um, and it's made me appreciate the restaurants and other people in the world who are working in restaurants in ways I hadn't appreciated them before. So there are ways we can find uh, gratitude or appreciation even in the midst of these, these challenging times. And gratitude can help calm those experiences of stress. Saying, you know what, this is stressful. And also true, and I'm learning something. I'm more connected to my family. I've been able to, you know, in my family, we've thought about how can we help people who don't have enough food right now, right? Thinking about that more. So maybe, you know, one of the things we learn is how do we take care of our neighbors better, right? Oh, okay. So, um, 
we do have some uh, resources for you to, to learn more uh, about resilience. So um, at Silver Hill, uh, we have a website and there's actually, if you go to our Silver Hill website, there is uh, a whole page and, and a bunch of materials related to staying resilient. And, and please feel free to go there and take a look. We have a lot of stuff you can download or look at. Uh, we also have a, uh, a team of people dedicated to focusing on resilience. And if you email them, resilience at silverhillhospital.org, uh, they'll, re they'll reach out back to you and, and uh, provide you some tips or consultation. Um, and then our, here at our very own New Canaan Library, there's a lot of great resources. And Laura, do you want to speak to the great resources at the library? Sure. Um, Susanna Lewis, who is there at uh, Silver Hill, she came to New Canaan and went through our extensive collection of books that deal with all the different types of uh, mental health strategies and um, just helpful books. And she selected about 22 books that uh, we have separated out from the library. We have them in this list, suggested books for coping with COVID stress. You are very welcome to just click on that. By the way, I just want you to know that this slideshow that you have been watching, I will be sending that out to all of the uh, registrants that uh, have been watching with us tonight. Um, so you will be able to uh, be able to click on that and uh, go right to the New Canaan library website where these books are located. And um, so we were very thankful that Susanna came over to help us with uh, just finding those perfect books uh, for that. Well, I see there are some uh, responses people have written in. There are some questions. So uh, do you believe in self self hypnosis and can it help in this area? Uh, well, certainly if you are able to hypnotize yourself and, you know, um, I think it can be useful. Um, so, sir. Sure. But that does take a lot of training. You need to learn how to self-hypnotize. Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, there are some forms of, uh, you know, biofeedback where you can, you know, work intentionally to lower your heart rate, lower your breathing. Um, so certainly, yeah, if you can... If you can engage in that form of relaxation, you know, go for it. Uh, I want to let everyone know if they want to ask a question. Um, I noticed that uh, some people have raised their hands. If you go to the participants at the bottom of the screen, uh, I think there's a hands button and it will go up beside your name and I can unmute you and you can ask Dr. Grote your question. Um, but I want to first, so everyone, if you have uh, want to do the hands, uh, you can set that up there. Um, there is one other question. Oh, there's a few other that are coming uh, up. But here's another one, Dr. Grote, from the question and answer area. And that is, can you speak about why it is important to write down gratitude? Yeah, sure. Um, one of the things about writing it down is it, it literally kind of helps us uh, visualize right? What we're grateful for, we can go back and look at it. And I also like to think of it as um, a, a kind of a, a memory book, if you will, something to go back to and, and revisit and uh, to, to be reminded of in those moments where, you know, maybe we're not feeling very grateful and we can be reminded of that. Uh, some other questions are, is there a specific meditation app <laughs> that you recommend or a technique of meditation that are there different kinds of meditation and what is a good one for say beginners or for this particular kind of working through stress yeah um <clears throat> you know i'm not up on all the different meditation apps that are, exist um in, in terms of at the moment i, I mean certainly if you um you know want to send me an email, I can, I can look into that for you. I have a colleague who studies meditation and, and um, can recommend something to you. In terms of the type of meditation, um, you know, I have gone through a mindfulness-based stress reduction course. You can, it's called MBSR, and you can find those. There are actually some that are offered online now, and it introduces you to kind of basic processes of meditation and ways of relaxation through mindfulness. 
Um, you know, there are some forms of mindfulness that are taught through what's called dialectical behavioral therapy. There are forms of mindfulness taught through some types of yoga. So there are uh, different types of, of mindfulness or meditation exercises out there. Um, I, I found the mindfulness-based stress reduction course to be, you know, really outstanding and, and recommend it. Well, now let's try uh, the hands. I'm going, Sandra, I'm going to allow you to talk. You should be able to speak now if you want to ask your question. You're going to have to unmute your microphone. Hi, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear oh, you. Well, thank you. I was about to ask a question. Um, what has been talked about so far? I'm 70 years old, and so I've had a certain amount of stress, and it's what's been talked about so far are things I have learned over the years and over the decades. But what I've, the stress I'm feeling right now is unusual. I think it's unusual. The COVID stress is an unusual situation that many of us, possibly most of us have never experienced in our lives. Mm -hmm. And I feel that I'm looking for something that addresses the fact that this is unusual and extraordinary and it's universal. Um, it's affecting not only everybody across my country, but across the world and the sadness is extraordinary. And I also at times feel very isolated because there's no unity. We're all, we're all, there's we're all mixed up or something you know we don't know what to do usually i get comfort out of unity or, or support but i i feel that everybody is just so um they don't know what to do so i think this is unusual and i've really loved everything you've suggested but um extraordinary times needs extraordinary measures and or maybe these measures that you've mentioned that we've known all along but need to practice are the answer. We can't go any better than that. Or is there something we can, how can we feel connected to like what's going on all across the world? It's, it's just so sad. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. Yeah, Sandra, I, I appreciate your speaking to the you know, unprecedented nature of this experience for, for all of us, for many of us. Um, you know, I, I am aware that the different ways I'm speaking of coping, which, you know, a lot of which are focused on things we can do for ourselves and maybe for others, um, is that, you know, they're, they're somewhat autonomous activities I do think that the greatest resource that is undertapped or uh, is is each other, mm. and that it will require, uh, I, I think, a sense of um, you know that we're we're really all in this together. You know, we face something that's a threat to all of us, and you know some of us may be more vulnerable to the illness of COVID than others. But the implications are far reaching and they've touched every corner of our lives. And you know, whether that's from you know, driving down the road and noticing that the store we used to go to is no longer open, which is sad. I, I grieve and I feel mourning for the losses on many, many, many levels. And I think having spaces where we can acknowledge that and what we're facing together is um, a missing element. And I think that I, I would add to this um, community. I, I think that we as a community, uh, there's an opportunity for us to, to face these challenges as a community. And, you know, right now, I think, you know, we can turn to our faith communities, um, can turn to, you know, for, potentially our families for support. 
um, but I really do think being part of a community, I, I do wish that there was more national unity. I know that's been fractured in many ways and there's been a lot of strain. Whatever political affiliations people have, there's been a lot of strain. And I think that has that limits our ability to connect to a higher purpose, a higher purpose that we're all humans. We're all trying to make the best of it. And how do we be there for each other? I'm glad you're speaking to us, Andrea. There is a, uh, 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 audience member that um, she writes that, um, you know, because we are all in this together, the entire world is in on this together. She yes. stresses that looking out for each other is helping her a lot. Uh, so I think, you know, being a um, person in the community to help is yeah. uh, restorative to her, it's, it, for her. And uh, that's certainly a, a, a possible way to go. Uh, there is another question uh, regarding children and teens, Dr. Grote. Um, in your experience, what has been your top three coping strategies for children and teens? What would you say to that? Well, you know, um, so I think we have to think about, you know, children's um, capacities. And so part of this is, you know, being able to recognize uh, symptoms of stress in children that, you know, children may not necessarily be able to verbalize some of the, the nature of their stress. They may uh, demonstrate it through irritability. They may demonstrate it through uh, withdrawal. Um, so I think part of it is at a first level, being able to, to discern symptoms of stress in children, which do show up differently, children and adolescents and then being able to uh, find ways that are age appropriate to help them cope effectively and have a sense of mastery and to be reassuring to them you know, that we're there for them, uh, that we can get through this together. Um, I know my daughter who's you know eight, um, you know, she's worried about COVID. She talks about it, how scary it is to go out into the world. And you know, we, we talk about how she can take care of herself. Um, we talk about um, how she can help take care of the family and, you know, how we're, you know, coping together as a family. So I think, you know, thinking about children and adolescents, you know, children and adolescents are in the context of a family. So I think it's about, you know, as a family, we can work on this together. We can find ways to relieve your stress, relieve your worries. And I think being able to talk to children in ways that, again, are age appropriate um, uh, about COVID and, and this you know, unprecedented time um, can be useful, that we're not afraid to talk about it and, you know, and, and can convey some facts, right? Try to address, you know, misinformation, making sure our children are well informed uh, and that they're able to, you know, be empowered to make good choices, you know, such as, you know, making sure they wear a mask. You know, for example, we always give our daughter information about why mask wearing is important and and she does it. Um, I'm going to invite Georgia Nagel to share some more about um, children and adolescents. Uh, Georgia, by the way, <laughs> Georgia Nagel is my wife. So thank you, Georgia, <laughs> for participating tonight. And she's trained, she's trained in child psychiatry. So I'm going to uh, ask her to write in some uh, additional thoughts, Georgia, on coping strategies for kids and adolescents. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Talk about doing it together, right? I can't do this alone. <laughs> do you want me? I can, if I can find her, she, if she raises her hand, she can speak out loud. I can find oh. her on mute her. Okay. So great. Georgia, if you, I'm going to try and find you, but if you oh. raise your hand, I'll find you faster. Okay. Let's see, because we have you see her? a number of people here. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Georgia Nagel, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, Georgia, I'm allowing you to talk. Okay, there she is. I think. Hello. Can Hi, you hear me? Georgia. Hi. <laughs> You've been pushed into this. I know. I, 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 I recruited you. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you as, as a child psychiatrist, I. Um, 
the most important thing as a parent or a family member with a kid is connecting with them and listening, hearing them out, not only just reacting to what they have to say, but just sitting there and hearing them. Um, you don't have to fix their problems. You don't have to really actively do anything at the moment. You could, you could even commiserate with them about something. And that is invaluable for whatever age group it is. Um, talking, connecting with your kids, not just isolate, like our, our child is into now video games and um, she can spend all day doing <laughs> on the computer or on her Nintendo or whatever. You know, if she had a phone, I'm sure it would be the phone. But um, having family time, I really try hard to having time where we could do board games and other uh, things that were, we were forced to look at each other's faces and communicate. That is huge. And of course, they learn from our modeling and our way of um, seeing things. So it's important to be a good role model, but also it's important to communicate most of all. Thank you, Georgia. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Yeah. I'm noticing that we are yeah. past our hour. Uh, anyone ha I, I see some other questions in the question and answer. Um, uh, well, there's no of, end in sight, division yeah. of the country in the world. I think we covered that as. Uh, yeah, and I can just speak briefly to the, the worries, right? The worry about family members. You know, I get it. This is a time, you know, where we worry about our, our parents, our, our loved ones. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, for the concern about substance use issues, um, you know, I think, um, you know, being able to talk to that person about your concerns is helpful. And, um, and you know, if, if it's, some of these things can be hard to do alone. So, you know, getting someone involved, another family member or friend to have a conversation about, hey, I'm worried about your substance use and here's why, um, you know, that can be a very important conversation. Um, and I think, you know, uh, for someone who's taking risks, um, I think continue to share our worries. I mean, the trouble is we don't control people, uh, but we certainly can control that you know, we express our, our concern for them and our love for them and, and why what they're doing scares us. Yeah. So everyone is to still still communicate. Yeah. Don't isolate. Still uh, communicate. Yeah. Uh, reach out in, on Zoom. Write letters. Uh, wave. <laughs> wave. Yeah, wave. That's a good idea. Wave. Um, smile a lot, even though it's behind <laughs> a mask. But I think your eyes will smile. Right. Yes, yes. I think that is, uh, that's, uh, that's where we'll end it. Is that okay, Dr. Grove? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it's, it's been terrific having you here and to share uh, with you in this moment. It's a very difficult moment. I do believe we can get through it together. And, you know, happy to, you know, come back and do something more to talk about, you know, how we can rely on a community, because that, that's a really important point. I'm glad that was raised. That is great. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. Thank, no, thank you for you. participating. That's made it very helpful. Um, and I wish you all well and a wonderful evening and a happy holiday yes. uh, as best as we can. Remember to wave to everyone you can. Yeah, I like the idea of waving, yes. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to see you at the library. Yes. Everyone take care, please. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Grote. Thank you very I, much. Well, my pleasure. Thank you, Laura, for sponsoring this. I really love. Oh, you. oh, we are so we are so glad to have to have you participate with us. Sure. People do come in asking yeah. us a lot of questions. We can't answer. We just we yeah. Can't answer. yeah. I got George on the line still, Georgia. <laughs> yes, Georgia. Thank you so much. Thank you, Georgia. Yes. I wanted to like remind you of a couple of things that I know we've talked about. <laughs> I know, no, but um, yeah, it's it's really really good to 
try to help as much as possible. Wonderful. Like to connect with others. Good. Thank okay. you. Good night, Dr. Good night. Grove. Good okay, we're, we're good. Okay, great. Good. Thank you, Laura. Good night. Take care, everyone. Take care. Okay, bye-bye.